Chairman, I would like to introduce Mr. Philip Sweeney. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank, uh, back again, uh, Chairman, or Phil. Um, this has uh, been getting back to the financial statements. There's, there's one line item that uh, one never sees on the financial statements, and that's a line item uh, for junketeering. Now, I get back to some questions by Peter Branson and Chris Short about the, uh, the fraud in the uh, CEO's office. Now, even if there had been no fraud in the CEO's office, what, what has uh, become very clear is that um, the previous management team um, were off having a jolly good time at uh, shareholders' expense as to, to all sorts of uh, locations. And just to give an example, and I'm, I'm sure shareholders would be shocked to see how their money was spent under the previous uh, management team, uh, in uh, 2014 and 2015 thereabouts, a select group of approximately FEMA, 20 female NAB officers were sent to a junket on with, um, with Sunday Islands to hear from a range of female speakers on the topics of empowering women, opportunity is now at the hand of the women to dominate and start winning over male counterparts. So the questions I have uh, coming from this is notwithstanding the fact that the subject matter of the junket could not possibly align with NAB's uh, policy of inclusiveness, and NAB is obviously, um, you know, obviously can't get its priorities right if it's sort of spending money on this sort of stuff, so how does NAB justify such an outrageous use of shareholders' funds at a time when NAB was culling its uh, risk staff? Uh, two, why were attendees forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement under pain of personal financial destruction if they shared the contents about the events with others? And uh, apparently the only reason this um, came out was that some of the attendees were so disgusted about it that they, 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 blew, they blew the whistle on it, basically. And three, um, how, what guarantee do shareholders have that there'll be no more junketeering of this nature under the new management team? Thank you. Um, so I'm not going to defend anything uh, because I, like you, do not feel that uh, many of the issues that came out from the investigation into the fraud and the chief executive office uh, were defendable. Uh, Ross, I think you made a comment in your opening address and maybe you want to reiterate it at this point. Can we okay, get Ross? can we get there? We're going. Yeah. Uh, I can't made it very clear to my senior team that this is your money, it's not ours, and we should be regarding it every, um, I keep thinking pounds, but every dollar that we spend should be justifiable for our shareholders. So you have my assurance that that's the lens I've taken. Uh, it's been interesting being part of a business that 80% owned by the government, which therefore is taxpayers' money. You think about things very, very clearly and who is the real owner. So that's the conversation we've already had in my first two and a half weeks. And uh, I would hate to think that you thought we were spending it on junketeering going forward, whatever that terminology means. Uh, thank you. I think that might be a uh, question on notice for future uh, AGMs about uh, how the shareholders' money has been spent and uh, mm -hmm. I hope uh, other cases like the Whit Sundays <laughs> doesn't appear, appear again. Good. Uh, just following on a question uh, from Mr Caulfield about uh, remediation payments, and I know uh, NAB has got uh, 950 people working on it, uh, but it still seems to be a fairly slow pace to get uh, remediation payments out, and uh, perhaps NAB are, are perhaps taking a, too much of a legalistic approach with this. And I note there's an article uh, in the Financial Review recently, it says customers win in AMP's mass refund pay payout, and it goes on to note here that AMP have put it in a policy uh, where they call it, if it's grey, we pay. So clearly it might be a, a means of speeding up remediation uh, process for NAB uh, customers is uh, perhaps uh, you uh, adopt the AMP policy and not necessarily take an overly legalistic approach in, in dealing with customer remuneration. remuneration. Thank you. Um, I think we are trying to get remediation monies into the hands of customers as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm also mindful, I um, might be channelling Mr Solomon here, that uh, it's the shareholders' money and we need to make sure that we're paying it sensibly where, uh, where it's due and not to be uh, um, careless with shareholders' money. Okay. Now, uh, getting back to uh, an answer that Ross made about legacy cases where uh, it's a matter of if new evidence comes to hand, I think that's probably a fair comment to say, well, OK, you know, we will always be interested in revisiting legacy cases when uh, new evidence does come to hand. But I'd just like to uh, elaborate a little bit on that point, uh, especially uh, the commitment the uh, chairman made to the uh, Senate uh, Economics Committee up in um, Canberra recently, uh, when 
this was the issue of uh, model it, uh, commitment to be uh, model litigant. And again, I congratulate the chairman for making such a commitment. Now, a question for the, uh, it came from uh, uh, the chair, Tim Wilson, the chair of the standing committee, it related to one of the Ds in the you know, delay, deny, um, and uh, op operating procedures. Uh, and when we get to the question of delay, one of the issues that a lot of uh, customers have is the delay in getting documents to uh, support their, their claims that they're unfairly treated by NAB. And the chairman made a commitment to um, Mr Tim Wilson that the, the customer should expect to get a document back from NAB uh, if it's uh, a recent one within a week and if it uh, required to be, uh, you know, be covered from archive, archival uh, storage then perhaps uh, two to three weeks. So I, I put a little uh, exercise in place here to see whether getting back to this, the picture that NAB seeks to present publicly and how they act privately. So I put in some requests for five documents from NAB's discredited trustee Nullis. And these are documents that I'm legally entitled to have. And in fact, uh, this goes back to March when the chairman made this commitment. In April, the, the government increased penalties following recommendation 3.7 of the Royal Commission on trustees and the director of trustees who, who, who failed to comply with their statutory uh, disclosure obligations as well as other statutory obligations such as acting in the best interest of fund members. And so here we have a case that uh, the directors of NOAS failed to provide five documents to which I'm legally entitled, which would be new evidence, which I could present to Ross and say, well, here's new evidence in this matter that I'm progressing. Now, given that there's a uh, now a criminal penalty of up to two years for each of these offences, so here we have a, uh, offences of, of 10 years in cumulative uh, after only a few weeks or months after the chairman had given a committee uh, of the, in, the, in Canberra uh, a commitment that uh, this would no longer be an issue. So the issue here is the trustees of NOAS are appointed by the board's nomination committee, which is currently chaired, chaired by the chairman, and uh, so are these directors going to stay in office if they continually act in such a, uh, which is a criminal, in a criminal conduct? So your comments, please. Uh, well, it would be helpful if I knew what documents um, you had requested. So I, I sent you a question on notice um, with the doctor's uh, documents listed. So I'll, I'm okay. more than willing to resend that question on notice to you with the documents well, listed out. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure my handy lieutenant here will be able to identify that for me. Mm, I know that. But... I think we'll be in, uh, back in direct contact with you. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, yeah, the, the, the follow that one up because it's an important one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.